We've all heard of tribes. We just may not have heard how scary they can be. From the skeleton tribe to Huli Wigman, today we bring you 20 scariest tribes you don't want to meet. Skeleton tribe in the heart of Papua New Guinea, nestled amidst the lush, untamed wilderness, lies the enigmatic Chimbu skeleton tribe. These folks take dress to impress to a whole new level, where over 60 highland tribes converge to flaunt their unique customs at the Mount Hagen Festival. The Chimbu, however, have a flair for drama that deserves an award. Once upon a time, these painted warriors adorn themselves to strike fear into the hearts of their enemies. Get this, the genes of this tribe carry DNA of a third unknown human species. Imagine facing a horde of skeletal warriors charging at you. Not your average picnic, but fast forward to present day and their motives have taken a delightful turn. The Chimbu have traded intimidation for celebration. Now, when they say they're painting the town red, they mean it quite literally. The vibrant hues and intricate patterns tell tales of their rich history. And their tribal dances are with such gusto that even the most stoic visitor can't help but join in. Ironically, not much is known about this tribe, despite their newfound fame. They may have strutted onto the global stage in 1934, but their mysterious aura remains intact. Perhaps they're secretly plotting world domination, one festival at a time, or maybe they're just reveling in the joy of sharing their unique culture. One thing's for sure, the Chimbu Skeleton Tribe knows how to make an entrance. Maasai A long time ago, among the wilds of Kenya and Tanzania dwelled a special group, the Maasai. With their bright red shukas and intricate beadwork, they knew how to flaunt fashion on the savannah, making even the most stylish giraffe feel inadequate. Renowned for their closeness to African game parks, the Maasai had a talent for blending in with local wildlife. The story goes that they once got together with a herd of zebras to talk about their style. After all, who could be a more qualified consultant on stripes than a zebra? The Ma language, spoken by them, was full of melody as a lion's roar, but lacked its intimidation, away with words that could charm even a grumpy buffalo. Off in the distance, many of these elders embraced local traditions and spoke only using that language. Among the community, they were like hipsters insisting on vintage language. For censuses, the Maasai had a unique approach. To them, it was an intrusion by the government into their private matters. Accurate information challenges some more than wrestling a crocodile. When the census rolls around, Maasai culture is known for its deceitful poker faces. Ultimately, they were a truly a unique group, vibrantly colored, charmingly personable with just a hint of playfulness. They knew how to keep life exciting on the edge of the African wilderness, wearing shukas and beadwork that made even wild lions smile. Himba in the remote corners of Namibia and Angola, there existed a group of people who were the ultimate masters of flexibility. The Himba, with an estimated population of 50,000, they were like a small, close-knit family where everyone knew everyone else's business, and they liked it that way. The Himba were a curious bunch, culturally distinct from their Herero neighbors. They didn't just speak any language, they spoke Ochi Himba, a variety of Herero. It was as if they had their secret code, a linguistic club that left outsiders scratching their heads. These semi-nomadic folks were no strangers to moving around. Rainfall was their compass, and water was their holy grail. They cultivated crops, but when the skies decided to be stingy, they packed up and moved faster than a cheetah chasing its lunch. The Himba were known for their unique appearance. Their ochre-covered skin made them look like they had just stepped out of a mud spa and their intricate hairstyles resembled modern art masterpieces. In their world, Bad Hair Day simply didn't exist. Being the last semi-nomadic folks in Namibia was no easy feat. They had to stay on their toes, ready to pack their bags, or rather their gourds and jewelry, at a moment's notice. But they did it with grace and style, proving that when life gives you arid landscapes, you make a fashion statement out of it. Yano Mami In the depths of the Amazon rainforest, where the trees have secrets and the rivers whisper tales, dwelled the Yanomami, an indigenous group so elusive they made Bigfoot look like a socialite. With around 35,000 members scattered across 200 to 250 villages, they were the ultimate hide-and-seek champions. 
The Yanomami were the guardians of the Amazon, known for their incredible knowledge of the rainforest. They could tell you which leaves to use for a headache and which snake to avoid for dinner, skills that made them the original survivalists. However, when it came to technology, they were more skeptical than a cat in a room full of cucumbers. You wouldn't find a single smartphone in their rainforest abode. They believed that the cloud was just a big ball of cotton up in the sky, and apps were what they used to shoo away mosquitoes. Living on the border between Venezuela and Brazil, they knew that national borders were as arbitrary as a toddler's scribble. They roamed freely, following the rhythms of the forest like the ultimate nomads. Huli Wigmen, deep in the lush highlands of Papua New Guinea, in the land of the Huli Wigmen, one might think they stumbled upon a tribe of dedicated hair enthusiasts. These folks, proud descendants of the legendary farmer Huli, take their tresses very seriously. For the young Huli lads, life takes a dramatic twist. The tribe firmly believes that their women are secret sorceresses who can drain a man's masculinity faster than a deflating balloon. So, to protect their precious manhood, these boys are banished from their moms and sisters and sent to the Haroli Bachelor Cut. It's like a Huli version of Boys Only Club deep in the jungles of Papua New Guinea. Here, these young lads undergo a rigorous 18-month to 3-year purification process involving more hair treatments than a Hollywood diva. They drench their locks in oils and herbs, ensuring their manes are in peak condition. When they finally emerge, it's not as mere mortals but as Huli Wigmen ready to strut their hairy stuff. Like any fashion-forward culture, the Huli have both their ceremonial and everyday ensembles. On regular days, you might spot a Huli wigman sporting a lighter wig and minimal face paint as if to say, I'm just here for the groceries. It's their equivalent of casual Friday, even in the wilds of Papua New Guinea. Inuit, in the frosty expanse of the Arctic and subarctic regions, where snowflakes outnumber grains of sand, the Inuit people thrived. These culturally similar, circumpolar folks had a knack for turning freezing temperatures into a reason to party. The Inuit had a unique linguistic talent. Their languages were like tongue twisters on ice, part of the Eskimo Alouette family that made even the most agile linguists stumble over their syllables. Inuit sign language was their secret code, but it was so endangered that even a polar bear sighting was more common. Living across the chilly landscapes of Greenland, Labrador, Quebec, Nanavut, the Northwest Territories, and Alaska, they knew a thing or two about layering. Inuit fashion was all a part of the fur, but it wasn't for fashion's sake alone. It was their way of saying, take that polar vortex. In Canada, they had a special classification under the Constitution Act, which made them neither First Nations nor Metis, but a distinctive group of their own. It was like being the Arctic's VIP club complete with a frosty velvet rope. Mercy. Now let's move on to a tribe known as the Mercy. These folks had a knack for turning isolation into a lifestyle choice, living in one of the country's most isolated regions. They were like the hipsters of Ethiopia, way ahead of the social distancing trend. The Mercy had a unique talent, their own language. Mercy, which was part of the Sermic language family. It was a language that would have made even the most seasoned linguists scratch their heads. Trying to speak mercy was like attempting a symphony with a kazoo. And let's talk about their neighbors for a moment. The mercy lived in a neighborhood with names like Ari, Bana, Karo. It sounded more like a guest list for an exotic block party than anything else. Now, when it came to religion, the mercy believed in a force greater than themselves, something called Tumwi. They thought it resided in the sky, but sometimes it showed up as a rainbow or a bird. They had their Kamoro, the priest or shaman who played the ultimate middleman between the community and the Tumwi. His job? To make sure everyone and everything was safe, whether from drought or a neighborhood tribe's antics. But perhaps what they most were famous for was their lip plates. Forget fancy jewelry, they had lip ornaments the size of serving platters. In the Mercy world, statement piece took on a whole new meaning. Serma, in southwestern Ethiopia, amid the wilds, sits a trio of tribes known collectively as the Suri. In those parts, dust kicks up like a toddler having a tantrum. They're known as Kai, Tamaga, and Baal, but form one big Suri identity. Unwinding a tangle of spaghetti can be difficult, just like trying to unscramble a complex situation. 
both have delectable results in the end, a peculiar family tree is what the Surrey now have. Although close geographically, their languages make it multiple parties. Multilingualism is like a linguistic potluck dinner, and each person adds their own taste to the experience. The Southeast Sermic languages, their languages, are part of the Nilo-Saharan language family. Figuring out their languages is difficult enough, but try navigating their territories as well. An unwelcome guest, the Ethiopian-South Sudan border passes through their backyard. These challenges do not deter them from being agro-pastoral people, working hard to cultivate agriculture while also tending to the animals. With their experience as seasoned farmers and cowboys, they have the agricultural skills and herding expertise. Having a built-in grocery store and rodeo just outside your door. No matter what you call them, these people are the Surrey. They have an interlaced language mixtape and non-stop border hopping along with a strong involvement in agriculture and animal husbandry. Southwestern Ethiopia is home to these unexpectedly delightful, diverse neighbors, a welcomed addition. Korowai On to the Korowai. These folks were the true pioneers of social distancing, living in an area so isolated that even the mailman couldn't find them. With a population of around 3,000 people, they were like the smallest neighborhood in the world. According to the Daily Telegraph, these guys were so cut off from the world that they didn't even know how other people existed until nosy anthropologists came snooping around in the late 1970s. Imagine the shock of discovering your neighbors after living your life thinking you were alone on this planet. Now let's talk about their language. Their language belonged to the Ayu Dumu family, which sounds like a secret club for linguists. They even had a Dutch missionary linguist create a dictionary and grammar book for them. Who needs Google Translate when you have a linguist on speed dial? But it wasn't just their language that set them apart. These folks were known for their tree houses, like the original architects of Airbnb. Living high up in the trees, they were the ultimate tree huggers, both literally and figuratively. Their economy was all about hunting, gathering, and horticulture. They could catch a fish faster than you could order takeout and they had the greenest thumbs in the jungle. While the world was busy with alcohol and Instagram, the Korowai stuck to smoking tobacco and living in tree houses. They were the hipsters of the forest, making you rethink your life choices with every sago pancake they flipped. Mundari tribe In the vast regions of South Sudan, where cows are currency and hair is colored with cow urine, the Mundari tribe stands out with its unique ways. They're not only shaking things up literally, but also figuratively as well. Among the South Sudanese plains, these people are their rock stars. As part of the Cairo people, the Mundari have their own distinct dialect named Kutuk na Mundari that could be like ordering food at an artsy establishment. Akin to mystifying phrases such as the challenging words in the sentence that can turn a serious Scrabble player into an insomniac for life. The tribal lands are positioned about 75 kilometers north of Juba, the capital of South Sudan. They live close enough to have a barbecue, but far enough away to avoid city traffic. When it comes to culture, the Mundari revolve around cattle. Cattle are like a type of Bitcoin, serving as currency and status. Forget about flowers, they offer cows when the time comes to propose. A fancier wedding usually comes with more cows. But here's where things get interesting. Their hair, they sometimes bathe it in cow urine. Weirdest hair care routine contest auditionees abound. They think of bright reds, yellows, and oranges as the pinnacle of beauty in their hair dyeing choices. The Mundari show that hair salons need not be a thing. They've got it all figured out. The distinctive rainbow-haired cowboy in the grasslands is actually an elegant representative of Mundari tribe. They transform normal customs into vibrant celebrations. Danny in the heart of western New Guinea's central highlands, where the air is as crisp as a potato chip and the mountains stand tall like giant broccoli, resides the Danny tribe. These folks are the real highlanders, and they've got more surprises than a magician's hat. With a population of around 100,000, they rule the Ballium Valley like it's their personal backyard barbecue, with the Lani people as their neighbors. Although some call them Western Danny, they're the Danny tribe through and through, no matter what the name tag says. Now, the Danny are quite the celebrities of Papa. Tourists flock to the valley like paparazzi at a Hollywood premiere just to catch a glimpse of these mountain-dwelling stars. 
If there were a red carpet for tribes, these folks would own it. Even language psychologists are intrigued by them. They're like the Gandalfs of linguistics, unraveling the mysteries of thought and language in their own unique way. Awagwaha, where the trees whisper secrets and the rivers hum lullabies, reside the Awa people of Brazil. With approximately 350 members, they're like a cozy village hidden away in the world's largest green maze. But here's the catch. 100 of them are playing an epic game of hide and seek with even the outside world. These folks speak Guaja, a Tupi Guarina language that's so unique even Google Translate is stumped. Originally living in settlements, they decided to take a walk on the wild side around 1800, becoming nomads to dodge the European settlers who just couldn't resist invading their turf. In the 19th century, the Awa had front row seats to the Great Forest Clearance Show courtesy of the European settlers. But they weren't ones to stick around for a bad performance. Nope, they embraced the nomadic lifestyle like a forest-loving gypsies. Fast forward to the 1980s, when the Brazilian government received a hefty loan and a nudge from the World Bank and the European Union. The deal? Demarcate and protect indigenous lands, including the Awas. That was crucial because without some intervention, these folks and their ancient culture were on the fast track to extinction. It took 20 years of campaigning, pressure, and some serious foot stomping from organizations like Survival International to finally get the Awas land demarcated. But by then, their numbers had dwindled, an encroachment on their land had them on the ropes. In a tragic turn of events, illegal loggers went so far as to burn an eight-year-old Awa girl alive in 2011. It was a horrifying warning to other native people in the area. These loggers meant business, and the Awa forests were vanishing faster than you can say save the rainforest. In 2012, Survival International launched a global campaign, backed by actor Colin Firth, to protect the Awa people. It was like a rallying cry heard around the world, a call to save a tribe that had danced with danger for far too long. Wode. Time to talk about the Wodabe tribe, a subgroup of the Fula people. They're like the rock stars of the Sahel, known for their nomadic lifestyle and fancy cultural ceremonies that make Coachella look like a backyard barbecue. Don't mistake them for Moboro, though. These are two separate Fulani subgroups, like comparing apples and oranges, or in their case, cattle and camels. The name Wodabe translates to cattle Fulani, which pretty much sums up their life mission dwelling in cattle camps and strutting their stuff. And boy, do they strut. Elaborate attire is their jam, making runway models look like they're just playing dress up. When it comes to language, the Wudabe speak Fula and aren't too keen on writing stuff down. In their language, Woda means taboo and Wudabe means people of the taboo. They're all about respecting taboos, which is their way of saying, we do things our own way, thank you very much. When it's not fashion week, the Wude lead a nomadic life with their longhorned Zebu cattle. They travel with their entourage, brothers, wives, kids, elders, making pit stops and camping out. And guess what? Their most prized possession is a massive wooden bed. Who needs fancy missions when they have a giant bed to call home? Their diet is as simple as it is hearty. Milk, millet, yogurt, sweet tea, and sometimes a touch of goat or sheep meat. Hey, when you're a nomad, you need all the energy you can get. Kamayuda, deep in the heart of the Amazonian basin of Brazil, there exists a tribe with a name as intriguing as their way of life, the Kamayuda. These indigenous folks are all about practicality. Their name translates to a raised platform to keep meat, pots, and pans. Who needs fancy kitchen cabinets when you've got a raised platform? These people are part of the Tupi Guarina family and they call the Upper Jingju region their home. Alongside their neighbors, they live around the Lake Ipavu, situated a leisurely six kilometers from the Kulian River. It's a bit like a serene Amazonian neighborhood, just with more trees and fewer Wi-Fi. When it comes to numbers, they're like the stock market. They've had their ups and downs. In 1954, their population hit an all-time low of 94 due to a pesky measles epidemic. But fast forward to 2010, and they're back on the rise with about 554 tribe members. They've made quite the comeback. A typical village looks like something out of a fairy tale. 
There's a round roof adorned with sape grass and a house of the flutes where men play important flute instruments, a music show where only guys get to rock out. Nearby, there's a meeting area where the men chat about fishing trips, festivals, and other manly things. Inside the house, it's a bit like a man cave, but with women and children. The lush rainforest surrounds the village, and private gardens can be found nearby for all their farming needs. History-wise, the region was declared a national park in 1961, all to protect the Kumayura from intruders and deadly epidemics. But before that, in 1884, a German explorer named Karl von den Stein paid them a visit. His exploration paved the way for other adventures and opened the doors, or paths, for non-indigenous people to mingle with the Kamayura. In their society, households are owned by groups of brothers. They decide what everyone should do each day, like your very own personal planners. Marriage involves the husband moving into the wife's parents' house, making it a true move-in with the in-law situation. Strong alliances are formed through these unions. After a bit of wrestling practice and muscle building during their teenage years, the boys become hunting and combat experts. The girls, on the other hand, focus on weaving mats, household chores, and dancing during their seclusion. They even get a new name and fancy ear piercings as part of their transition to adulthood. And let's not forget the ceremonies and rituals, the Feast of the Dead and the Celebration Feast of the Warriors. These shindigs bring together the upper echelon, making their way of life a party in the heart of the Amazon. Sand Bushmen The Sand People, affectionately known as Bushmen or those who pick stuff up off the ground, have quite the nomadic legacy in southern Africa, spread across Botswana, Namibia, Angola, Zambia, Zimbabwe, and South Africa, they're the OG hunter-gatherers of the region. While others were settling down and getting comfy with cattle, the sand folks were like, nah, we'll stick to foraging, thanks. In 2017, Botswana was crowned the sand capital with around 63,500 of these folks, making up 2.8% of the population. But remember, they've been doing their thing for centuries, long before Botswana was a thing. The term Bushmen and sand are both used to describe them, but the sand folks have quite the opinion on it. Sand is the more widely accepted term in the West, thanks to Western anthropology, but Bushmen still makes a cameo from time to time. It's like choosing between pop and soda, there's no wrong answer, but some folks prefer one over the other. In their homeland, they're simply called by their nation's name. It's like a personalized name tag for a cultural potluck. And while Bushmen might be a tad derogatory, sand is the official lingo in South Africa and even features in the national coat of arms. It's got that official seal of approval. But wait, there's more. In Botswana, they go by Basarwa, which means those who do not rear cattle. It's like a cattle-free club, and they're not afraid to embrace it. Nuba Inhabiting the scenic Nuba Mountains in South Kordorfin State, the Nuba people are true multitaskers of Sudan. These folks have a quite complex life situation in place. The round mud huts in their villages add a cozy, rustic charm to the perfectly organized family compounds. They have a designated fire pit for epic tales and engaging stories. Can you imagine sitting around the warm embers, listening to stories from their exciting escapades, much like how we watch Netflix today? Only instead of streaming services, they might call it fire flicks and thrill. The backyard, a mini farm of sorts, goats, chickens, and donkeys coexist comfortably together in the tog while being flanked by durs, tall, conical granules that may as well be from a farm simulation game. Nuba people, multilingual speaking, use languages unrelated. Living in a linguistic buffet is just like it. Not only do they engage in discussion, but also spend time dealing with agriculture activities, growing rice and soil preparation on the nearby hillsides too. They're basically the OG locavores. Maori Ah, the Maori people of New Zealand, the island's original MVPs. These folks have been around since the 14th century, and they've seen it all, from canoe voyages to clashes with Europeans, and they've got the culture to prove it. Picture this. Maori settlers arrive in New Zealand between sips of coconut water, and boom, they're here to stay. Isolation turns them into cultural pros with their own language, myths, 
crafts and performing arts. They're like the OG influencers, setting trends independently. Then Europeans roll up and let's just say things get a bit wild. In 1840, a treaty was presented and they tried to give coexistence a whirl, but disputes over land sales lead to conflicts in the 1860s. There's even a part where they declare the treaty null and void, but the Maori folks don't give up. They've got resilience like no other. Efforts have been made to give the Maori culture a boost, and traditional Maori vibes are making a comeback. But they've still got some obstacles to tackle, like lower life expectancies and incomes. The Sinhalese, the Sinhalese, the ultimate island isolationists. These folks have been living it up on North Sentinel Island in the Bay of Bengal, and they're not exactly throwing beach parties for outsiders. Unlike your average resort goers, these folks have a strict no visitors allowed policy. They've been known to get a tad hostile when outsiders drop by, to the point where they've actually taken out a few trespassers. Yikes! This island is the Sinhalese version of You Shall Not Pass. The Indian government got the memo and declared a three-mile exclusion zone around the island back in 1956. They even have a constant armed patrol to keep intruders at bay. And no, you can't even sneak a pic for your Instagram. Photography is prohibited. As for their population, it's a bit of a guessing game. Estimates range from 15, seriously it's like finding a needle in a haystack, to 500. Most folks settle on a number between 50 and 200. Maybe they're just really good at playing hide and seek. Despite all the secrecy, we do know a few things about them. They're hunter-gatherers who probably use bows and arrows to hunt and some pretty basic methods to catch seafood. They've got a thing for mollusks and their settlements are like seafood feasts. Pieroa The Pieroa people guard the forest in secret, living in an area larger than Belgium without even needing a visa. They have quite a sweet gig. Attempting to estimate the population is comparable to trying to total all the stars in the night sky. There are reports of 15,000, while others suggest numbers as low as 15. Most people generally choose a number between 50 and 200, which is the perfect potluck size. Since around 1780, when they were discovered by missionaries and explorers, these people have been doing their thing. Self-governed villages have been doing the autonomous, peaceful anarchy thing ever since scattered across the land. The best part? They basically despise authority and are against hoarding resources. Cooperation and individual autonomy are their things, making them the chillest neighbors around. They also teach humility, pacifism, and positive moral values while committing to monogamy. Moken, the Moken people, also known as the Sea People, are basically the maritime experts of Southeast Asia. With about 2,000 to 3,000 of them living, they have their own Austronesian language, a distinctive lifestyle, and a knack for living off the sea. These folks have been cruising around on approximately 800 islands, which both Myanmar and Thailand seem to want a piece of. The Moken have this semi-nomadic hunter-gatherer thing going on, with the sea being their go-to supermarket. Now, they're not so thrilled about assimilation attempts by Myanmar and Thailand, who'd love to invite them to their cultural potluck. Their language remains a steadfast barrier to such efforts, but it's not all smooth sailing for the Moken. Their population is dwindling, and modern property laws, conservation programs, and tightening border policies have them feeling a bit adrift. These sea gypsies, as they're sometimes called, no relation to Romani folks, are all about sustainable living. They forage for food using simple tools, roam the sea in groups of families, and don't believe in owning natural resources. While they're ace at sea survival, they're also pretty good at trading stuff like sea cucumbers and pearls for essentials at local markets. Plus, they're experts at maintaining social harmony. If someone's got a beef with another, they just pack up and join another kin group until things simmer down. It's like the ultimate family road trip strategy. Thank <laughs> you.